Welcome everybody to our second of our series of UAA STEM Talks. I'm Omega Smith and I will be hosting us today with our guest presenters, Dr. Aaron Hicks and Dr. Nate Hicks. So i um, really thrilled about the presentation for today. We're gonna to be talking about the light and the dark side of the universe today. And we have two of our UAA scientists joining us today. So we have Dr. Aaron Hicks who is Associate Professor of Astronomy at UAA. And she does her main research in supermassive black holes. And she works with a team of UAA students and international colleagues studying black holes from the ground and space-based observatories to study the active growth of black holes and how they shape our galaxies that we even live in today. And we also have uh, Dr. Nate Hicks, who is an Associate Professor of, of Physics at UAA. And he works in the plasma lab at UA with UAA students. His research is mainly in uh, plasma physics, including the use of radio frequency electric fields to trap plasma. So very interesting subjects for today's talk. And I'm glad to have you guys all here with us. And we will start the presentation with Dr. Aaron Hicks, and then we'll take a brief moment of questions before we get into Dr. Nate Hicks's presentation and take questions for that as well. So I do see we have uh, Dr. Aaron Hicks up first, who's gonna be talking about the dark side of the universe with her studies in black holes. So Dr. Aaron Hicks, are you ready? I am, thank you, Omega. Okay, so welcome everybody. It's great to have you with us this evening. Today, I'm gonna to talk about galaxies and in particular, the part of galaxies that focuses on what we can't see. So there are many components to galaxies, but there are two in particular that uh, we know are present because we can infer their influence. We can infer their presence from the influence on, on the parts that we can't see. So um, these two parts would be black holes and, and dark matter that I'll focus on. And just to get us started off, I've, I've shown here a picture of the Andromeda galaxy. And so the Andromeda galaxy is our nearest big galaxy neighbor, and it looks much like we expect um, our own galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, to look. It's this disk of um, material, that, and so it's a, a flattened um, disk of stars, gas, and dust, and we see this rotating around the center of the galaxy. The key thing here is for a galaxy that it's, it's held together by gravity, so all of this stuff is gravitationally bound together, and as you move towards the center of the galaxy, um, the stars get denser. And you see in the Andromeda galaxy, there's this bright patch in the middle. When we look at our, our own galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, there's been a lot of effort towards studying the movement of the stars in the very center of our galaxy. And this is work that's been done by Dr. Andrea Ghez and Dr. Reinhard Genzel, observing these stars over the past 20, 25 years. In fact, they recently received the Nobel Prize in physics for this. And shown here in this inset is the movement of these stars over the course of this period of time. And what it, we can tell from this is from our understanding of how things move in our universe, meaning the laws of gravity, we can, we can predict how these stars should be moving based on all the stuff that we know about in our galaxies. So that would be all the stars, the gas, the dust. We, we see this stuff, we see that it's in our galaxy. And so we can account for all of that and add up all of the mass that we, we believe is present in the center of our galaxy. And then we can compare that to how these stars are moving. And what it was found was that these stars are moving far faster than they should have been. And so from that, um, there were a number of theories put forward to try to explain why these stars are moving so much faster than they should be. And the winner of those theories, the one that held up to all of the experimental tests was that a black hole is sitting in the center of our galaxy, a big, huge amount of mass that's not producing any light. And it's um, the black holes, a bunch of material in a very, very small space. And by definition, it's not producing light. I say this because the speed that it would, that would be needed to escape from that black hole exceeds what we call the cosmic speed limit, the speed of light. And so once you get too close to these objects, you're not able to get away. In fact, even the, the fastest moving material or fastest, sorry, the fastest moving stuff in our, in our universe, that being light, cannot get away. And so once you get too close to these black holes, nothing can get out. And so no light is coming from these black holes. And that's why we don't see the black hole sitting in the center of our galaxy. But we can infer its presence through the motion of these 
these stars. And this was a really big surprise that a black hole sits in the center of our galaxy. But the idea of black holes sitting in the center of a galaxy was not a new one, actually. I mean, you probably remember a couple of years back, the big announcement that the first picture of a black hole had been obtained. And that was in a galaxy called Messier 87. And so that first picture is shown here. Um, and in fact, it's not a picture of a black hole, right? Because black holes can't produce light in themselves, but they, the material that is around them, um, if there's material falling into that black hole, that process of falling towards the black hole produces a lot of light. And we can see in this picture, oops, this picture here, what's producing light is the material that's just about to fall into that black hole. But there's a hole in that light. And so we're seeing kind of like, you can think of it as the shadow of that black hole. The absence of light is present there. And that is because of the black hole that sits in the center of this disk of material. And I say that it was the idea that a black hole sits in the center of a galaxy was not completely new because we knew there were these strange galaxies out there. Galaxies were something unlike the light that's produced by stars or gas. Um, it, is, is being produced in the very center of what we call these active galaxies. And so these active galaxies, one, they have strange amount, strange um, properties of the light being produced in the very, very central region. And they also have these jets. And you can see these jets, this material being thrown out of the center. This is actually largely plasma material that you'll learn about plasma um, from Nate Hicks in the next talk. This material is being thrown out of the central region. So we know something unique is happening in these galaxies, but they are a very small subset of galaxies, a small percentage of all the galaxies out there. Most of them have nothing happening in the center, much like we find with our own galaxy, the Milky Way. But prompted by the discovery that a black hole that's about four times, four um, million times the mass of our sun sitting in the center of our galaxy, studies were done to, to look at the black hole and many other, or look at the, the centers of many other galaxies. And although this is um, an artist's impression of what's happening in the center of M87, where you have material falling in gravitationally being pulled in towards the black hole that sits right in the center there, a little bit of that material before it falls into the black hole gets shot up into these jets, but the rest of it, it gets too close to the black hole and it's never coming out, at least not in, in um, a relevant time scale to the evolution of a galaxy. And what happens if, if in these galaxies is unique though. And so looking at the, the normal galaxies like our own, um, are there black holes in the center of these? And the, the discovery was, yes, there are a huge, um, all of the galaxies we believe now have black holes sitting in their centers. And there was, that was surprising um, in itself, but even more surprising was the fact that these black holes seem to be a key element of, of forming a galaxy. And we say that because when we look at how big a black hole is in a galaxy, that is really tied with how big the galaxy itself is. So the smaller galaxies have small black holes. So this is to scale, the small galaxy here, Messier 32, it has a really small black hole, just a few um, times, a few million times the mass of our sun. So similar to the mass that our galaxy has. But the really big galaxies like Messier 87, one in which we got the first picture of that black hole um, is a really big galaxy, much larger, and it has um, a few billion times the mass of our, our sun in its black hole. So this tells us that if you're going to make a big galaxy, you have to also make a big black hole, or maybe it's vice versa. If you're gonna have a big black hole, you have to also form a big galaxy around it. And so our whole picture of how galaxies form changed because we had to fit into that model a black hole sitting in the center and a black hole that most of the time isn't actually doing anything but being present and gravitationally influencing the things nearby to it. So this was a big change in, in our view of how galaxies and these, these big structures in our universe form. Right, there we go. And so uh, I'll just quickly mention that a lot of my work focuses on answering this question of what role do supermassive black holes play in forming the galaxies that we see in our universe? And so this is work done with a large number of students here at UAA, as well as a lot of international colleagues. And we use data from the biggest telescopes that we have available to us today, um, both space-based and, and on the ground here on, on Earth. Um, and we need those big telescopes because we need to be able to see in as much detail as possible close to that black hole. And so we study how the stars and the gas are moving around that black hole to try to understand the details behind 
how is a black hole growing and what's happening to the galaxy, it's a big, huge galaxy that it lives inside of um, while that growth of that black hole is happening. Because we know you can't make the black hole bigger. It can't consume a bunch of material without also changing the galaxy around it. And this being so fundamental to understanding how galaxies form, um, we, we want to try to answer this because there's many other things that go along with that. How do galaxies form? How do stars come to be? How do the planets around stars form? How is it that we're sitting here talking about this? It's all tied into if you can't form that, that galaxy, then all of those other steps can't happen um, afterwards. And so um, it's a, a big open question right now in the field. And um, we have a lot of great facilities available to us now and soon to come in the future. You may have heard of the James Webb Space Telescope, for example. Um, getting these new facilities online will open up windows for us to be able to answer this question in ways we don't have available to us yet. So let's highlight when we look out at um, the universe, we, we know that there are so many galaxies out there. This is just one very small patch of the sky. And we look and we see each of these galaxies out there, which in this picture, virtually every single point of light you see is a galaxy. So that galaxy contains billions of stars. Our sun is just one of you know, billions of stars that exist in our galaxy. And so each of the galaxies we see in this picture here, we now believe has a supermassive black hole sitting in the center of it that played a role in shaping the galaxy to be what it is in today. And there's another component um, that is not seen in these pictures. This picture here is what, what our eyes would be able to see if we were able to see with the, the power of you know, the Hubble Space Telescope um, looking at a certain you know, particular patch of the sky for many, many days. Um, what we find is you know, hundreds, if there's thousands of galaxies just in this small patch, and each one of them has that black hole, but also has dark matter around them. And so we're, when we look out at the universe and the light that we receive from these objects out there, it's not obvious that these missing components are there, but they, we have found have to be in order to form the universe that we now live in. And so when I, I say that dark matter is present, that first piece of evidence that that dark matter existed was by looking at how galaxies rotate. And so these disk galaxies, much like our Milky Way galaxy, um, rotate around the center. And we can say, well, how much mass is there? We understand how things move in our, our universe. We understand the laws of gravity, then we should be able to predict what, how fast a galaxy is going to move because we can look at it. We can see how many stars are there, how much gas and dust is present. And so we can predict how that galaxy ought to be rotating and the speed at which it's doing that. And what was actually found is the prediction of how galaxies move is much slower as shown on the right-hand side here compared to what was actually observed. And this is work done by Dr. Vera Rubin she found that galaxies are moving much faster than we can account for. In fact, if we say that this galaxy only has the mass that we can see, the stars, the gas, the dust that we know is present through its producing light, then that galaxy moving at the speeds that we observe it to be moving should blow it, it should fall apart. It should just fly, all that material should fly away. So it tells us there's something else there holding this galaxy together. And that something else has to be mass. And so there's some other material present that's not producing any light, but is gravitationally holding that galaxy together. And here's just a graphical representation of this idea. If you look at the center of the galaxy, you can see how things are moving. And so you can, you can map the speed that the material is rotating around the center. And so in the center, we measure one speed. As we get further from the center, we see that speed um, increases. What we would expect based on the material that is visible to us is that galaxy should get you know, the rotational speed, how fast things are moving around, should get faster and faster. But then when you get to the edge of where it looks like the stop, the material stops, the edge of that visible part of the disk that's producing light, once you get beyond that, the speed of the, there's some cold gas out there we can still measure. That cold gas that's producing just a little bit of light that we can, we can trace the motion of the material out there with, it should get slower and slower because the bulk of the material, the bulk of the mass is sitting in the center here. This diffuse gas that we see out here is not adding a lot of mass, but 
although this is our predicted, the expected rotation of that material, it's moving much, much faster. So from the, the motion of that cold gas in the outskirts of the galaxy, it's moving really, really fast compared to what we would predict. So it tells us there's a lot more mass present than we can see. And so it's dark matter um, that we say, you know, there's, ma there's material there, it's not producing light, it got the name dark matter. What exactly dark matter is, we don't yet know. It's likely some um, particle, um, not totally unlike what we already have as our description of the material that exists in our universe, but unlike it in that it does not produce light. But there are standard models of particle physics that can, can pre predict material that would have the properties needed to explain what we're seeing with dark matter. But we have yet to be able to detect any of these particles. So it is still very much a mystery as to what this material is, but it has to be present or galaxies would fall apart. They wouldn't be, they'd, they'd just rotate and throw the material out rather than be gravitationally held together as we see. Here's just another um, graphical or illustration of this, where the, the blue haze you see here is this dark matter, what we term the halo. And the, the visible part of the, the galaxy is buried inside this envelope of all of this dark matter. In fact, there's far more dark matter in the universe than there is the normal stuff that produces the light that we see. And so there's about 85% of the matter that's in the universe is this dark matter. Um, and so there's a lot more of it present than the, the normal stuff that we, we think of being everything that there is in the universe. And in fact, none of what we've talked about would exist in our universe if dark matter were not present. So what I'm showing here is a simulation of how the universe evolved. It was material pretty much uniformly distributed all over, but then gravity slowly pulled this material together. And if we didn't have 85% of the material in our universe um, as dark matter, if all there was was the stuff that we can see, the normal matter, then these structures would never form. What you see, oh, so it's gonna start over here, but what you see um, is the blue is cold material being gravitationally bound together. And then eventually it gets a little bit brighter in the center regions where it's getting densest. This is where the galaxies are forming. Eventually, you know, we see stars forming there, big galaxies start to form. This is where the planets form. This is where we live in our universe or in these dense regions of, of material and gravity has pulled it together. But if dark matter wasn't present, then what would have happened is that formation process would not have occurred the gravity would never have been powerful enough to be able to pull the material together. So we owe dark matter, the fact that, that galaxies ever formed to begin with, the normal matter that produced light just kind of came along for the ride. And so um, it's dark matter that resulted in the structures, the galaxies that we see in our universe. So I'll just, um, I think I'll leave it here with this beautiful picture of the Hubble Ultra Deep Fields. Um, and just again, highlight that although when we look out at the universe, we see all of this light that we that is being produced by stars and gas and dust, but much of that, um, although that, that is what we're able to most easily study, we now know that there are other components to these galaxies that are really essential to forming the galaxies into what we see today. And these are components, black holes, dark matter that aren't producing any light. Um, so we need to study them through the influence that they have on the stuff that does produce light. And I will leave it there and be happy to take questions. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Hicks. Okay, so we do have a couple questions already from our Zoom audience. Um, and let's see here. So starting at the top, uh, can a galaxy have more than one black hole? Yes. Um, that's a really key question um, for us to try to understand because we know that galaxies collide. They, that's a, a natural part of what we see happening in the universe is that things kind of form as smaller galaxies and small galaxies build up to larger galaxies. And so when two galaxies are in the process of, of becoming one, they will each carry their black hole to the, what will ultimately be one galaxy. And those two galaxies will sink towards the center and become one big galaxy. The time scale that that actually happens is, is 
uh, unknown at this point, but something that's a really a big focus of study. And that's because when those black holes merge, we know gravitational waves are produced. So we want a really solid prediction to be able to understand how frequently are we going to be able to measure those black holes merging as galaxies come together and form a bigger galaxy. Awesome. All right, yeah, we're getting quite a few questions come in now. I'm gonna jump over to our Facebook audience. We got a question from Joseph Plummer. What steps are being taken currently to better understand dark matter? Uh, so there are a number of experiments around the globe um, that are aimed at tr trying to detect what are um, theoretical predictions of what dark matter actually is. And so these experiments are, you know, so from the theory side, um, they can build models of, of what, you know, is a particle physics question. What is that particle that can it be, have properties that we need them to have in order to fit the description of the observations of what this dark matter is. And from those theories, there are predictions such as, um, they're called WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles. And so um, along with the prediction that such a particle should exist are a number of properties, one being that they don't produce light that we can detect, but and that they are um, producing enough mass in our universe to, to explain our observations. And so based on that, they then build experiments to try to detect the influence of these particles. Um, and as of yet, there are no um, positive detections of any of these particles. So maybe it's just, it's that hard to detect them, or maybe our theories are, have not yet led us in the right direction to, to find these particles. All right, that was a great question. Okay, um, more questions from our Zoom chat. So a question from YB. Where does all the objects that get sucked into a black hole go? Is it a wormhole? Does it go somewhere else? Yes, yeah, so um, my quick answer is we don't know. Our theories that describe the universe break down when it get, comes to black holes. So um, there is the, the description of what the universe is like leading up to getting close to a black hole. There's the event horizon that if you cross that, that event horizon, you've gone beyond where you'll ever be able to escape. We can still describe the universe in that space, but once you get to what's called the singularity, where the mass of the black hole is actually placed, um, our laws of the universe, our description of the universe breaks down. And so we don't have a full description of the universe to be able to answer that question. Um, but there are sure a lot of people working on trying to better describe what a black hole is and its nature of where all that material is going. Yeah, no, that's a very, very interesting question too. Okay, um, from Zachary Erickson, do supermassive black holes appear exclusively in galaxy centers? And then he has a second part um, about dark matter after you finish. Sure. So. There are actually two kinds of black holes. And so I haven't mentioned the other kind, but supermassive black holes tend to sit in the center because that is where the center of mass of the system is. And, but through the, the merging system you know, of, of two galaxies or three galaxies merging together, there are uh, phases during that where it looks like one galaxy and the black holes may have merged, but they might be slightly offset of the center. So things are dynamic, things change. And so the black hole isn't necessarily gonna be sitting perfectly at the center. There can also be one of those supermassive black holes that through the merging process that can get kicked out of the system and only one will sit there. And so we can have rogue black holes out there that don't have a galaxy to live in anymore. There are also black holes that are the remnants of, of old stars, stars that have run out of fuel and died. So those are very small in comparison to the supermassive black holes, that's the name. Um, and those are scattered throughout the galaxies. All right. Okay, and uh, his second question is, in recent years, have any plausible alternatives to dark matter explain, explanation been proposed? So I'd say that none that I've found very compelling. Um, there are certainly a lot of, because we have not been able to, to pin down what dark matter is, there are still a lot of theories out there, but the key is you have to have a theory that's testable. And so to be able to test those theories, um, that's where you can answer this theory holds or it doesn't. 
Um, and so some of these theories that are proposed for what dark matter could be, they're just not necessarily testable. And so you wouldn't necessarily consider this a valid theory. Um, but there, um, I think there's a lot of promising evidence to, to move towards be believing that our description of these particles, um, WIMPs, for example, is, is not perfect, but we're on the right track. And I say this because when we put particles into our um, simulations and try to simulate how does the universe, universe form the structures that we see today from beginning to, to now, um, putting in material that has the properties similar to these weakly interacting massive particles works well. And so we have a, we're headed in the right direction, it looks like, but we don't, we certainly don't have answers yet. Okay, and another question um, relating to the one you just recently answered from Jessica Noble. If a black hole gets kicked out, can it form a new galaxy? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, it has to be able to pull enough material in to form that galaxy. So it means that that material has to be present. And so if it is in a region where there's enough gas um, and dust, then it can pull that material gravitationally and start to pull material around it. But at this point in the universe, um, there's not pockets of, of overwhelming amounts of gas and dust to be able to start forming no galaxies. The galaxies we see today, really they formed in the very beginning, um, shortly after what we think of as the beginning of the Big Bang. And those galaxies didn't take very long to start forming. And really they've been um, only changing through the stars that, that live in those galaxies, uh, running out of fuel and new stars being formed or through this merging process of galaxies. Um, there is a process by which you can pull in cold gas, um, but if a black hole were kicked out of another galaxy, um, it depends on when that may have happened, but generally it will have enough speed that it'd be traveling along and stay isolated rather than have more material form around it to form a galaxy. That's fascinating. <laughs> Okay, um, and one last question from our Zoom audience, from Che Colbert. Did you say that due to the absence of light, black holes are likely made up of dark matter? No, and I, I can say that because um, our description of dark matter is one in which that dark matter um, cannot become very dense. And so that is a requirement because that is where we see the dark matter and how it is distributed throughout our universe. It does not get very clumpy. It stays rather diffuse. And the reason that this is, is as you take material and you condense it into a smaller region, it gets hot. But with normal matter, it gets hot and it releases light and it cools off. So it can continue to get compressed further and further down and form a galaxy. But for dark matter, you start to compress, the gravity pulls that dark matter together, it heats up, but it can't release light, so it can't cool off. So it's gonna stay out in a larger, more diffuse um, structure. And so dark matter seems to be very separate than black holes. Now that having been said, we have so many unanswered questions and gaps in our, our knowledge. Who knows how this picture, you know, 10 years from now even might, might change. But at the moment, uh, our leading theory suggests that black holes and dark matter, although both have properties that they can't be seen, they are separate. Um, black holes are made of normal matter. It's just compressed into a very small state such that we have um, a black hole forming this hole in the space-time continuum, but they're made of normal matter, the stuff that used to make, you know, produce light, but now that light can't get out to us. All right, that was a great question too. Okay, well, I think that is gonna be time for our questions for Dr. Erin Hicks. If you do have more questions for her, go ahead and keep writing those in the chat. And at the very end, if we got some time, we'll go ahead and answer those as well. But for now, I wanna pass it on to our next presenter. So that's gonna be Dr. Nate Hicks. Uh, Dr. Nate Hicks, are you ready? I am. I've just noticed that all this evening daylight we've got is streaming into this office and making funny patterns on my face. So <laughs> we'll just bear with that. It's just more of the light side of the universe. Oh, great way to put it. All right, I'll let you take over. All right, thanks. I'll go ahead and switch over to my slides. All right, hopefully that's coming through. So. It's always a pleasure to talk about the plasma state of matter, which uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna call the light side of the universe. And 
on the St. Patrick's Day, I get to put in a green lightsaber as well. Lightsabers kind of look like plasma jets or plasma wands. So those are always fun to involve as well. And what we see in the background here is a fascinating event on our own star, the sun. Back in 2012, there was an eruption that occurred uh, combining first a solar flare and then a coronal mass ejection, which expelled tons and tons of solar matter out into the solar system. And then after this, in the aftermath, we see these loops of so-called coronal rain. And this really illustrates the interplay between the plasma state of matter and the magnetic fields that are present in the sun. The plasma is uh, constrained to follow magnetic field lines. And so by visualizing the plasma, which is here emitting ultraviolet radiation that was captured by the Solar Dynamics Observatory, we can learn a lot about the magnetic field structure of stars uh, like our sun. And this is not only beautiful and of theoretical importance, but it's also really important for understanding and uh, predicting space weather events. With these big blobs of solar material uh, impinge on the Earth, they can have uh, great consequences for our technological society. All right, so let me move some windows around. And before I get started, I just want to thank all of my excellent uh, student researchers in the plasma lab. Uh, at UAA. This has been a tough year with the pandemic. Uh, laboratory work is, is highly constrained, of course, but we've been doing some good computer simulations remotely and looking forward uh, to next year, hopefully returning to normal. Also want to gratefully acknowledge support from funding agencies like uh, the U.S. National Science Foundation. Here in Alaska, the Space Grant Program has been really helpful to uh, supporting students, and then several entities at UAA uh, have supported undergraduate research as well. So thank you to all of those groups. All right, so many of us may have heard of plasma in various contexts. Plasma, for the, uh, the purposes of this talk, is not the blood plasma that you may have heard of, but there is kind of a, a, a relation in the uh, linguistic origins, but plasma is often called the fourth state of matter. So we're familiar with solids and the liquids and gases. We know that by adding heat to solid ice, we can turn it into liquid water and go from there into a vapor, steam. If we add even more thermal energy, we can start to strip some of the electrons off of uh, molecules and atoms. We can dissociate the molecules and ionize the atoms. And then what we get is a collection of charged particles, usually electrons and positively charged ions. Sometimes we can have a mix of negative ions in there as well, and some neutral particles that have not been ionized. So why do we call this plasma? Well, it goes back uh, to the early 20th century with some of the pioneering work of people like Irving Langmuir. And so here's a picture of Langmuir in uh, his laboratory. And as we know, in the early 1900s, there was a lot of fascinating physics being discovered. So here, Langmuir is actually pictured in the same photo with oh, people like Einstein and Max Planck, Heisenberg, Schrodinger, uh, lots of other luminaries of physics uh, that have come to define modern physics as we know it. So pretty cool that plasma has uh, some of its roots as a science in that time of great uh, physics revolution. So one day Langmuir was in his laboratory and he observed that the electrical discharges they were studying in tubes of gas had a resemblance to the way that blood plasma carries around uh, red and white corpuscles. And so uh, he proposed this description of gas discharges uh, to be called plasma as well. And there's also a connection to the Greek uh, term plasma, which is uh, to mold or shapeable. So sometimes plasma uh, assumes really interesting kind of gelatinous shapes. So there's a connection in that sense as well. There is a more subtle and kind of formal definition. So it's not just that it's a collection of charged particles. It has to be the case that these particles are interacting with each other over long ranges and the kind of close collisions are not the dominant effect, but the collective effect that leads to waves and shielding of electric and uh, magnetic fields is what really defines a plasma. So where do we find plasma in the universe? Well, all over. I'd, I'd like to thank the previous speaker for talking about the difficult topic of things we can't see. Fortunately, plasma is really easy to see. Uh, both in the natural environments and in technological cases. Uh, so way out in the cosmos, we can see in the interstellar medium, even the intergalactic medium full of plasma, things like nebulae. As we get closer in to Earth, our own solar neighborhood is full of plasma. And certainly in more extreme latitudes, we can see uh, the aurora, which is a plasma phenomenon. 
And when we think of man-made things, uh, if we uh, create various flame conditions, there is a plasma component uh, to those. And then technology that we produce, fluorescent light bulbs, the tube in here actually is a container of a plasma discharge. Hopefully in the coming uh, years, hopefully not too many decades, we will harness plasma to do uh, magnetic confinement fusion energy. So that's a technological goal that we have. So we often call plasma the fourth state of matter, but we should remember that it could uh, properly be called the first state of matter. And it's the most prevalent state of normal matter in the universe uh, still today. 99%, well actually well over 99% is in the plasma state. So why do I say that it could be the first uh, state of matter? Well, if we look back somewhat shortly after the start of the universe with the Big Bang, well, for the first 300 to 400,000 years, the universe was entirely in the plasma state. It was so hot that it was impossible for the electrons and the protons in our universe to combine and form neutral atoms. And in this uh, hot plasma uh, condition in the universe, there was a lot of light being emitted. It was actually somewhat of an orange color of light, but the plasma itself is opaque to the transmission of light. And only after the universe expanded sufficiently to cool down and allow the plasma to recombine into neutral atoms, then that light was free to propagate throughout the universe. And this picture here uh, might be familiar to some of you. This is the cosmic microwave background. What was orange light about 400,000 years after the start of the universe has now had its wavelengths stretched out by the expansion of the universe all the way into the microwave range. And anywhere that we point a microwave receiver in our sky, uh, we detect this background microwave radiation. So this is really a snapshot of what the universe looks like just after cooling down enough to no longer be completely plasma. And some of these little fluctuations in the microwave background are what led to the structure of galaxies uh, that we observe today. So plasma is certainly ubiquitous. There are some reasons why it's very important as we are seeing <clears throat> In the picture of the solar behavior, we can have geomagnetic storms that can ultimately reach uh, Earth. So in this video, you can see the process of uh, the magnetic field actually uh, bulging out from the surface of the sun. And as this happens, the plasma and the magnetic field interplay stretch outward and finally break. And this bulge of magnetic field loops reconnects to form its own kind of separate plasma blob that can then travel out uh, through our solar system. And this is what is called a coronal mass ejection. Fortunately, they're fast, but not so fast that we don't have uh, some warning uh, that they're on their way. We can observe activity on the sun and these reach speeds of somewhat like 250 kilometers per second up to maybe thousands of kilometers per second. So they're cruising right along, but we know they're coming and we have some time to prepare uh, for them reaching Earth. Uh, and when they do, we have a situation that looks like so. So as uh, this solar activity launches a blob towards us, these are very large uh, amounts of, of mass. They can actually dwarf the spatial scale of the Earth and they have their own magnetic field entrained. So when the magnetic field of this solar coronal mass ejection blob interacts with our own Earth magnetic field, there can be reconnection of the magnetic field lines such that the material in the coronal mass ejection streams down these field lines towards our north and south magnetic poles. When it does so, this stream of electrons and protons from the sun interacts with the molecules in our atmosphere, excites them, and when they de-excite, they emit the beautiful colors that we associate with the aurora. So for a very strong solar storm, uh, we might see this auroral activity extend farther and farther south for the case of the aurora borealis and another great St. Patrick's Day connection, the green aurora that we often see uh, in the sky. Now, fortunately, our magnetic field does a good job of diverting most of the solar plasma around Earth. A planet like Mars that uh, does not have a strong magnetic field has actually had its atmosphere stripped off in the past by all of this solar wind uh, bombarding it. So we want to appreciate our magnetic field, but also realize that there are some really strong solar storms that can uh, damage our technological infrastructure. So any large pieces of conducting material on the ground, like our telecommunications network, our power grid 
can be severely impacted by a strong solar storm. So we do need to take precautions to strengthen those systems in anticipation of uh, the big solar storm that's probably lurking out there in the, in the future sometime. Okay, other reasons plasma is really important. Well, our sun could not shine without uh, the hot plasma undergoing nuclear fusion in the core. So how does this work? The uh, sun has a lot of protons in it, and sometimes you get the event where four, uh, four protons will contribute to the so-called proton-proton fusion chain. And you can see in this process of events, ultimately what uh, comes out is a lot of little gammas, which are photons of light uh, taking energy out of the fusion reaction. And also some protons come out and some helium ash uh, is left over as well. So this is a very robust process for something like a star that's got lots and lots of mass, but it's much harder uh, for us to reproduce stellar fusion here on Earth because this proton-proton chain is relatively unlikely to happen unless you've got so many protons like a star does. So if we want to reproduce uh, star power on Earth, we need to use a different sort of fusion reaction, which uh, for most Earth fusion research uh, concerns some isotopes of hydrogen. So the D and the T down here are deuterium and tritium. This is like a normal hydrogen, but with an extra neutron added on in the case of deuterium and two extra neutrons for tritium. And when these deuterium and tritium particles collide fast enough, they can fuse together and release some excess energy. And the amount of energy that they release is actually given by Einstein's famous E equals mc squared equation. The mass of what went in, the D and the T, is slightly more than the mass of what came out, which is a neutron and a helium. And that mass difference uh, can be expressed as the energy gain of the fusion reaction. So if we could get a lot of deuterium tritium fusion reactions going, we could harness the excess energy coming out. And this is an ongoing goal for our society. If we could do it, then it would represent a virtually limitless, clean, sustainable, uh, climate-friendly energy source that could solve a lot of uh, the problems and challenges for humanity and our Earth. It turns out to be very, very difficult. Uh, scientists and engineers have been working on this since the 1950s. And of course, in that time, the Cold War was ramping up. But the US and the Soviet Union, also the United Kingdom, realized this was such a difficult problem that they should declassify all of the research and just work together. But even with that great breakthrough in peaceful nuclear research, still really hard to do. So nowadays, uh, the mainstream approach is what's shown in this large picture where there's a person here for scale. This large device is called a tokamak. And the biggest one ever is being built in the south of France. It's called ITER for International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. And this, is, it is hoped, will show a net power producing fusion reactor for the first time. So how does a tokamak or other magnetic fusion reactor work? Well, unlike the sun case where gravity is holding all the fusion plasma together, on Earth, we need some sort of bottle or container for the plasma. And we usually do this with strong magnetic fields. So if you can take a container and twist it into a donut shape or a torus and run a strong magnetic field around the shape of that donut, then the plasma, as we saw in the case of the sun, is constrained to follow the magnetic field lines. And it's hard for the plasma to diffuse out and reach the walls. If it did, the hot plasma would both cool down and it would also melt the walls. So we really want to keep our hot fusion plasma away from the reactor vessel itself. So the tokamak is good at this because it has a strong magnetic field in two directions, around the donut this way, and then also twisting to make a net helical sort of shape. So this eater tokamak is going to do deuterium tritium fusion in the 2030s. It's going to produce hopefully five to 10 times more power out than it takes to run it. And it also costs 30 to $50 billion. So it's the biggest, most costly science experiment in the world, but it also has the potential to demonstrate that fusion could be the energy of the future for our species and for our planet. All right, so how does this tokamak thing really work? So there's this large donut shaped vessel or container. All of the normal air is pumped out to make an ultra clean vacuum condition. And then uh, deuterium tritium fuel are admitted in and the plasma is initiated by a strong electric field. And then it's a matter of making it hot and dense enough to reach fusion conditions. So we need temperatures of about 100 to 200 million degrees Kelvin. And 
then it's a question of keeping it bottled up long enough that the fusion particles have a chance to do that reaction. So what does this look like if we took some imagery of a tokamak discharge? So hopefully this YouTube video will actually work. There we go. That's even got some evocative sound along with it. Uh, this is a relatively small tokamak in the Czech Republic called Compass. And you can see the time counting up here. So this would be milliseconds. So this plasma discharge or shot as it's called runs for a few seconds. And what you can see here is the glowing plasma on the sides. Then occasionally some little flashes of light. Sometimes we call these UFOs for unidentified flying objects in the plasma. These are actually dust particles from the wall of the reactor. You can see them uh, light up as they become ionized themselves and have some emission of light uh, in the process. But interestingly, there's plasma throughout this donut-shaped vessel, but you can only see it near the edges. That's because the plasma that is really hot in the center is completely ionized. It doesn't have any electrons left, and you need electrons making transitions up and down in energy levels to emit visible light. So it's only the non-fully ionized uh, particles on the edges that really show uh, visible light. But in any case, it's a beautiful example of a tokamak plasma. However, tokamaks do have some challenges. One of the chief ones for the Big Eater project is what happens if there's a sudden disruption of the plasma current flowing around that donut? That is indeed called a disruption. It puts tremendous mechanical and electromagnetic stress on the machine. And when you've built a $50 billion tokamak, you would hate to have it break due to a disruption. So there is a great alternative called a stellarator which does not require any plasma current flowing around the donut and therefore is intrinsically free from those disruptions. The challenge with the Stellarator is it has this incredibly complicated coil shape with the advent of uh, very powerful supercomputers. It's been possible to design a perfect 3D coil set to achieve a nice robust Stellarator plasma with no disruption, disruptions. But the Stellarator has some catching up to do. The tokamak is already a, a really well-developed concept and it's kind of to the demonstration stage almost. But Stellarators are an excellent idea as well. And now with the pressure for clean energy really mounting in our society, there are many other alternatives being pursued as well to try to replicate star power. This one uses what's called a spheromac plasma. So a spherically shaped plasma still having that toroidal uh, aspect of magnetic field. But this one actually uses mechanical pistons to launch a shock wave into the plasma. And that's what does the heating and compression of the plasma. This is taking place in Vancouver, BC. A company called General Fusion is pursuing this approach. A lot simpler to build something that has a spherical container than a donut shaped one. So it has that going for it. Down in Southern California, a company called Tri Alpha Energy is shooting blobs of plasma at each other, combining to again make a toroidal shape. As you see, that toroidal donut shaped plasma is a really important thing to strive for. Uh, but this has also a fairly simple engineering case to be made uh, with a tube shaped machine. And this is advancing rapidly in its performance as well. So I think uh, necessity is the mother of invention. We're seeing the need and the demand for uh, clean fusion energy. So some of the private enterprise is really becoming involved in this as well as the traditional government funded entities. So there is a knock on fusion that it's 20 years away. That's what they said in the 1950s when uh, people started working on it for the first time, but it's remained uh, 20 years away as progress has been made. So maybe it always will be 20 years away and that would be depressing. But other people who have worked on fusion uh, point out that it will be there when society needs it. I think we're to the point where society is definitely looking for something like fusion energy. This quote is from uh, the father of the tokamak uh, concept in Soviet plasma physics research. And this is why all of these startup companies are springing up all over, uh, like spring plants. So this one is a, a kind of advanced tokamak concept in the UK. There's a really exciting project coming out of the MIT group. And uh, this is located in the Boston area called Spark. And then there are other tube shaped things called Z-pinches. Uh, some are in Seattle, <laughs> others are in the uh, Southwest of the United States. So it's interesting that we've got this great growth of concepts and hopefully there will be a convergence to something that really works to get fusion power on the grid sooner rather than later. 
there's certainly a host of other reasons why plasma could be considered important. So in our technology and industry, uh, the entire growth of microelectronics is due to plasma processing of semiconductors and computer chips. We've seen various lighting applications like fluorescent bulbs. Uh, certainly plasma TVs are not as common as they once were, but still plasma production of light is very important in lots of different cases. There are other areas of growth in plasma research like plasma medicine. So this looks a bit like a lightsaber. It's a small plasma jet or a plasma wand that can actually be applied to healthy human tissue to treat certain disease process. Uh, and at UAA, we're doing some uh, student-led research on atmospheric pressure plasma. So uh, some students have designed this uh, atmospheric pressure plasma device, and it's gone through the design process and 3D modeling with CAD software. Finally, they built this, and it's a series of sharp needle tips with high voltage applied to them, and it produces what's called a corona discharge. So this is one case where corona is a good thing. It's not coronavirus, but corona that looks kind of like a crown of plasma around the sharp electrode tip. So another great application of uh, plasma, possibly for treating things like cancerous tissue or sterilizing uh, bacteria. Also plasma propulsion is an exciting realm. The high speed of plasma particles can allow a very high rocket exhaust velocity. So at UAA, there's been work to develop a helicon plasma source. And this involves a combination of a special radio frequency antenna with a strong magnetic field. So students have optimized the radio frequency antenna design through some computer modeling and also optimized the magnetic coil set. And now we are just waiting to get back in the lab to actually install these things, create a strong magnetic field that can be used for all sorts of different plasma applications. All right, and students are making measurements of various plasma properties like density and temperature. And certainly the magnetic coil set is its own enterprise in itself. The last thing I'll mention before my time is completely up is the multipole plasma trap project that we have at UAA. This is a way to bottle up plasma without needing a magnetic field. So by having a set of electrodes that form a boundary around where you'd like to contain some plasma, and applying a switching voltage to those electrodes, you can actually focus plasma particles to the center of this 3D trapped volume. And so this is primarily a simulation activity, but we do hope to build this electrode set and install it in the vacuum chamber at UAA very soon. And a lot of the students in the plasma lab have been running these computer simulations of inserting plasma particles, applying that radio frequency field, and seeing that the plasma remains trapped. So this simulation goes on for 10 or 20 microseconds. So just a small fraction of an instant actually has a really long time to keep these plasma particles around. And what you see here is that the circular distribution of plasma stays intact. It does not leak out through these black electrodes. So this is all uh, good work that students are doing. And hopefully we will uh, continue this in the months and years to come back in the lab. All right, I sense that my time is running short. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip to the end and just uh, remind everyone that plasma research is a really hands-on thing that we can hopefully get back to doing. And anybody who wants to join in and do research as a UAA student is welcome to get in touch with me. We have students from all majors in the STEM fields, engineering, biological sciences, and so on. And every time we turn on our plasma chamber, something new and exciting happens. This is student, uh, iPhone video of our Planetarella experiment, which is kind of a simulation of auroral processes. Okay, so thank you for attending tonight. And yeah, I'll wrap it up there and be available for Q&A. Thank you, All right, thank you, Dr. Hicks. I do have to mention, um, right now I'm not getting your audio coming through on Zoom, and it looks like it's just me because we still have uh, several people in the chat asking you questions. So I might be about five seconds delayed because I'm working off of our Facebook audio. Okay. Okay. I can, All I right. can respond so, to some um, chat questions have, myself if you want. Are we, I, um, I should be able to read through here. Um, If 
So it looks like I'm actually getting you now. Okay, let's go ahead and start with the questions. I do have a couple questions from Facebook. We'll get to that first. Um, Betsy Bring asks, how do the magnetic fields in the tokamak function as a container for all that energy? Right, so in the tokamak, the donut shaped device, the idea is that by having a series of electrical current carrying coils that kind of loop their way around the donut, they create a magnetic field that points in the direction of the, of the donut or the torus. And a charged particle uh, by electromagnetic forces will just go in trajectories that spiral around that magnetic field line. So the simplest thing to do is just make a magnetic field that follows the donut direction and the charged particles will be stuck following those field lines. It turns out to be a little trickier than that actually because the electrons and the protons will tend to separate and form their own electric field that causes the whole thing to drift out of the tokamak. And that's why that extra twist is put in that helical shape. By twisting the magnetic field lines as they go around the donut, then you can balance out uh, the drift of the particles out of the device. And so it is the uh, containing effect of the magnetic field that keeps the plasma away from the wall but it is still not perfect. There is always diffusion of particles across the magnetic field at some finite rate. And that has been one of the great challenges of tokamak physics is to keep the turbulence uh, in a fusion plasma low enough that the diffusion of particles across the field is slow enough to have fusion occur. So it's not solved or we would have had reactors on the grid back in the 1970s probably, but that's the general idea. Right, great. So from Betsy as well, she asked, what, which is your favorite invention or fusion invention? Well, it's hard to argue with uh, all of the physics understanding that has come out of the tokamak enterprise. So even if you might have a favorite alternate concept like the Stellarator or the Z-Pinch or whatever, the tokamak has really paved the way in terms of not only understanding itself, but all the plasma physics that have to be dealt with for any fusion reactor. So that's why ITER, the big tokamak, is going ahead regardless of the progress on the other fronts, because it will be the very first experiment to be a so-called burning plasma, which means that it's producing a, a significant fraction of its own energy, maybe even past break-even, where it uh, puts out more energy than it takes in from plugging it into the wall and uh, turning it on. So by exploring the burning plasma physics for the very first time in ITER, we may discover things about uh, fusion physics that we had no anticipation of and which will inform the progress of those other alternate concepts. So to answer your question, I'll say the tokamak. <laughs> <laughs> it was very fascinating. Okay, um, another question. This is from our Zoom audience from Jessica Noble. Is there really no harmful byproducts to fusion? That's a great question. So this easiest fusion reaction to do, the deuterium tritium, spits out a fast moving helium uh, nucleus, which is itself pretty inert. You know, helium is a noble gas. It doesn't uh, chemically react with anything. And that, because that's a charged particle, it stays in the tokamak. And I see there's another question about helium ash. So when I say helium ash, I mean what's left over after the fusion reaction, which does not contribute to the further fusion burning, if you will. So the helium is an inert uh, byproduct. It also contains a lot of energy. So it's those helium nuclei called alpha particles that stay in the fusion reactor and actually further heat up the fusion plasma. So eventually if you get an ignited fusion plasma, you don't have to do anything else as far as heating it up externally. You just kind of let it burn with its uh, helium uh, nuclei that are uh, sustaining it but the main energy production comes from the neutron that gets ejected out. So deuterium, tritium in, helium and neutron out. The neutron is not electrically charged, so it does not stay in the tokamak. And that's why we can harness it for energy, which is great. However, the neutron impinging on the metal structure of the tokamak device can make it radioactive over time, but it's a very short-lived uh, radioactive waste situation. So you would have to swap out your tokamak shell every uh, couple of decades and let it uh, decay in radioactivity fairly quickly, put in some new parts. So it's not like the conventional nuclear power where you've got this uh, long-lived radioactive sludge that will be around until many centuries uh, from now. The other uh, danger, if you will, from conventional uh, deuterium-tritium fusion is that the tritium itself is a toxic uh, substance. It does not uh, naturally occur in any significant abundance on Earth, so it has to be produced within the fusion reactor itself. So you can put in some lithium around the tokamak, Deuterium plus lithium can make tritium. And so because it's a tritium facility, you have to have some uh, 
safeguards for the toxicity of tritium. But the fusion reaction is so hard to get going that if anything goes wrong, it just kind of snuffs out. It's not like a nuclear fission reactor where you could have a meltdown scenario that has been depicted in certain uh, movies or an explosive event like Chernobyl. These are just not uh, intrinsic properties of a fusion reactor. It's not to say there are zero risks, of course, but there's nothing that is a long-term environmental consequence and nothing that's uh, an acute kind of disaster. That's still fascinating. Okay, um, I see that does answer someone else's question when they're asking more about helium ash. Uh, so we'll move on to, we have a question from Shay Col Jay Colbert, which I see now is actually one of your uh, students in your plasma team. So I hope I'm not mispronouncing your name, but she asked, when was our last solar storm and how often do they occur? Solar activity occurs frequently with uh, various intensities. Now, something that could be really dangerous for our infrastructure Something like that occurred in the 1800s, the so-called Carrington event, I think it's called. And that was so powerful that the big metal infrastructure on the ground at that time was railroad tracks and telegraph wires. And certain telegraph stations had so much current induced on the telegraph lines that the telegraph paper caught fire. So, okay, you can replace telegraph paper easily enough. Today, we have sensitive electronics. We have transformers for our power grid. So if something uh, like the Carrington event happened today, we would have a lot of damage to our power grid and our uh, communications infrastructure. But those massive, massive coronal mass ejections are not happening every day or anything like that, but they happen frequently enough that we should really take some safeguards uh, to protect our systems against them. All right, well, I think that might be all the time we have for questions. If you guys have any more questions, for either Dr. Aaron Hicks or Dr. Nate Hicks, feel free to email us and I will pass those questions on to them. Um, and you can also find out more information about our presenters and their contact information at uaa.alaska.edu backslash STEM talks. I want to thank you very much, Dr. Nate Hicks and Dr. Aaron Hicks. It was absolutely fascinating to have you guys present for us today and we look forward to hearing more about your research.